But I just want to introduce our very first speaker, which is actually Richard Evans' son, Jason Evans. So, Jason is a former researcher at the UNR Department of Agriculture. Also at UNR is where he gained his master's degree in biochemistry, and now he serves as a very passionate scientific educator for the Nevada Connections Academy. So we're very honored to have Jason give us our very first talk on a very important topic of evolution and science in general, because as a lot of us know, the theory of evolution doesn't stand up very well unless we know how old certain things are. And one of those things is the age of the Earth, the age of rocks that we find fossils, and Jason's going to tell us all about it, how, using science, we know how these things are done. So Jason. Thank you. Pop your shirt in, boy. No. Yeah, I do. <laughs> All right, so thanks everyone for coming. Um, as Dr. Drum said, one of the foundational ideas behind evolution is the um, being able to prove that enough time has passed on Earth for it all to happen. Because without really very long time scales that are completely beyond human understanding and perception, the whole theory falls apart. So, as our first talk today, we're going to I want to show you some of the methods that we use to show that the Earth really is 4.6 billion years old. So how do we really know how old things are? And this isn't working. There we go. So what proof of age do we have when we're talking about things that existed before humans were even around? There were no humans around, um, you know, tens of millions of years ago. There's no written records, no one was there. So how do we know? So a good scientist always demands proof. You never just believe anything because someone, some smart person with a diploma or wearing a white lab coat tells you so. You always want to have that proof. You always want to be able to verify observations and repeat them. And there are plenty of historical errors that we know to be true, even though there's no one currently alive who experienced them. I mean, no one here in this room denies that the American Revolution happened, even though I'm pretty sure no one was alive when that actually took place. So we have to look at the available evidence, look at the amount of evidence that exists from how many different sources, um, different types of data and experiments, and put all that together to kind of get an idea that we can be relatively sure what we're looking at is what actually is going on. And some of these concepts are difficult. It takes a very long time to fully and completely understand concepts like radiometric dating, evolution, carbon-14. It takes a long time to study it. It's not an easy subject to understand inside and out. What's important is that you know that with the proper education and training, you could understand it. Okay? I don't understand anything about you know, dark matter, the Big Bang, you know, inside the math, all that, I couldn't do, tell you anything about it. But I know that if I really dedicated myself, the information is there, that I could understand it. And there are people who do, a lot of people who do. It's also about how many people agree, how many experts, how many people who are in this field of study who have dedicated their lives to understanding this, and not only trying to prove it, but trying to disprove it. Scientists out there all the time are trying to prove theories wrong and make a name for themselves. And when they can do it, they make a name for themselves. When they don't, they keep trying or they move on to something else. The more people you have checking each other, verifying work, repeating work, writing it up, you're moving, you're inching closer and closer and closer to a true reflection of reality. And, you know, you can't be an expert on everything. You can't. You, you, know, you just don't have the capacity to do that. So at some point, you have to say to yourself, enough experts agree on this, and I understand it well enough that I will accept this to be reality, unless something comes along to sh prove it otherwise to me. Keep that open mind. But you know, at some point, if you want to hold anything as reliable, you have to say, this is reliable enough. Science is the search for fact, not truth. Science looks for working models of reality. It's not, about, it's not necessarily about the absolute fundamental truth of reality. It's about coming up with systems 
and models and routines that work, that we can put towards a purpose to better the quality of human life. And if these models work, we will continue to use them. If we find imperfections in those models, we will modify the model. Something that just recently happened in the last couple of weeks. Uh, astronomically, anyone hear about that? Pretty big, uh, pretty big discovery. The, the, dis the uh, verification of gravitational waves. This is something that was predicted by Einstein 100 years ago. He predicted it in his theory of relativity, but he, the math was all there. The math said these things are happening, these are out there, but the equipment was not good enough to detect the gravitational waves, not even close. Okay, well, well, this has been a prediction by his theory for 100 years, and just recently the equipment's become sensitive enough and we've had the technology to verify that. So this is an example of a scientific theory making a prediction that we had no way to verify at the time, but after enough experiments and technological advances, boom, Einstein is right again. So, so how do we check verify, prove the age of the Earth. <coughs> the main tool we have in our toolbox is radiometric dating. So how does this work? Basically certain compounds in nature decay at a constant rate. They change from one element into another. This means that element A will change into element B at a constant rate. A set amount of time, this much of the compound will decay into a new compound. And there's various methods, by pathways by which it can decay that we won't necessarily get into right now. So we use this to determine how old something is. Looking at the surface on these two pictures, which one do you think is older? The one on the left or the one on the right? Oh, oh, oh. oh yeah, yeah, the one on the right, okay. All things being equal, without anybody trying to pull some kind of massive trick on us, it's pretty obvious the one on the right is older. Now, are we 100% absolutely positively sure the one on the right is older? No. 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 I mean, the one on the left could have been vacuum sealed, could be fake, you know, who knows. But without the introduction of that evidence, those facts, it's safe to assume the one on the right is older. So, what we do for radiometric dating is we look at the ratio of compounds present in these rocks element A and element B. What's the ratio of the amount of element A that there is compared to element B? This will give us an estimate of when these rocks turn from a liquid to a solid state. You know, rocks are formed from cooling magma, volcanic lava, things like that originally. So this gives us a date, an estimate, of when these rocks solidified. Some rocks are, you know, if you go to Hawaii, and you go to Mount Kilauea, you got some brand new solidified rocks. They just came out of a volcano, they solidified, now you have solid volcanic rock. But some rocks, like meteorites, like some of the rocks found towards the very interior of the continents, go back towards the very beginning of the formation of the Earth. And this operates under the principle of uniformitarianism. This is one of the assumptions we make in Earth science. It's a pretty safe assumption, I, agree, I think, and it assumes that the laws of nature today, all the um, observations, the physical processes that we observe today, those held true since the formation of the Earth. We haven't seen any evidence, or we have, not, we have no data showing that they've ever drastically changed, so we operate under that assumption. So let's go into a little bit more about how, exactly how radiometric dating works. And I like to use the jar of candy analogy. So let's say that okay. you have a jar of candy, all kinds of good stuff in it. Lollipops, a bit of honey, Tootsie Rolls, jelly beans, right? And you know that this jar has 100 Tootsie Rolls in it. It's all mixed in with all the other stuff, but you know there's 100 Tootsie Rolls in it. Okay, so you only want Tootsie Rolls, but it takes you 15 minutes to pick out half of the Tootsie Rolls. How many Tootsie Rolls will be back in the jar after 15 minutes? Pick out half of them. How many are left in the jar? 50. It takes you 15 minutes to pick out half of them. 
So as you pick the Tootsie Rolls out of the jar, they become harder and harder to find. Okay? If, if you start with 100, how many will be left after 30 minutes? It takes you 15 minutes to pick out half of them. 25. 25. It takes you 15 minutes to pick out the first 50. Okay? Then they become harder and harder to find. So it takes you a little bit longer to pick out another half of them. That doesn't make sense, but you know what I mean. <laughs> um, so it takes you 30 minutes. And after 30 minutes, you're going to have 25 Tootsie Rolls left in the jar. So you know that a certain jar starts off with 500 Tootsie Rolls. And you're coming home and you're looking forward to some Tootsie Rolls and you find some kid rooting around in your candy jar. And you want to know, how long has that kid been rooting around in my candy jar? After assessing the damage, you find out that there are only 125 Tootsie Rolls left in your jar. And you know it takes the kid 15 minutes to pick out half of the Tootsie Rolls. So, based on this and working backwards, how long do you think this kid was rooting around in your candy jar? 30 minutes. 30 minutes. Takes him 15 minutes to pick out the first 250. Takes him another 15 minutes to put, pick out another 125. You're left with 125. 30 minutes. This is called half-life. And this is how radioactive decay works. Half-life of a radioactive element is the amount of time it takes for half of element A to decay into element B. And it is constant. There is nothing we have observed in nature that um, can affect this rate. We can't slow it down. We can't speed it up. It's constant. And this is why radioactive waste is such a big problem. Because it is, there's nothing we can do that we know of right now to affect it. So all we can do is try to contain it. So for example, uranium, after several steps in a chain, will ultimately decay into lead. And it turns into a lot of nasty stuff on the way to there, on the way to lead, for it's stable. But you're going from an unstable state, where the atom of the radioactive element is trying to basically shoot off energy and get to a stable state, and it takes several steps until it finally gets there. Uranium will eventually decay into lead, where it becomes stable. And there are two major ways which we can radiometrically date old bones and rocks. The first one is carbon-14 dating, and this works with stuff that was at one time alive. And the other one is potassium-40 dating, which we use on rocks that were never alive. <laughs> so carbon-14, <coughs> this works with things that were once alive. It works with plant material, um, it works with actual uh, bone and flesh material, if, if, if it survives that long, for whatever reason. You know, something that maybe gets locked up in the ice and doesn't decay. It doesn't work with most fossils, because most fossils don't, aren't actually organic anymore. They've been mineralized, they've been replaced by inorganic substances. So, most of the really old fossils we find aren't organic anymore. So it doesn't work on really old fossils. So carbon exists in all living things, everything, down from the single cellular life forms all the way up to us. Everything exchanges carbon with their environment. When you eat, you're taking in carbon. When you breathe, you're taking in carbon. You're exchanging carbon with your environment all the time, as long as you're alive. When something dies, it stops exchanging carbon with the environment. So you can use that as a point of reference. When did this organism die? How long ago? So, once it dies, it stops taking in carbon. And there's carbon-14 everywhere in the environment. It's radioactive, it's harmless, but it is there. Okay, it's not a dangerous radioactive material. Carbon-12 is your everyday, normal, quote, type of carbon. Carbon-14 is slightly radioactive, and it does decay. And it's everywhere. And it exists in nature in a constant um, amount. So what we do is, when we're exchanging carbon-14 with the environment, and then we stop, or die, the carbon-14 begins to decay. And what we do, carbon-14 is a half-life of 5,730 years. So it takes 5,730 years 
for half of the carbon-14 that's in that organism to decay. So we can compare the ratio of carbon-14 in a dead organism with atmospheric levels to allow an estimation of age. So if 75% of the original carbon-14 is gone, how many half-lives is that? So if, it, if it, one half-life, 5,730 years, another half-life, 5,730 years, about 10,400, um, I'm sorry, 11,000. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this is carbon-14. And this works with, you know, fragments of baskets, because baskets were woven from you know, plants that were once alive. You use this for stuff that's, you know, not millions of years old, but in the range of thousands. And it's only accurate to about 75,000 years old, because our instrumentation has a hard time detecting the amounts reliably after that much of the carbon-14 is decayed. Hopefully we'll get better. With more sensitive instruments, maybe we can go back even further. All right, so here's a big one, potassium-40. We're getting into millions and billions of years here. Potassium-40 is a radioactive element that we use to date very old rocks. It only works with igneous rocks. Okay, it doesn't work with sedimentary rocks or metamorphic rocks because sedimentary rocks are basically just pieces of other rocks. So you break up a bunch of rocks, smash them back together, so it's all mixed up with <coughs> sedimentary rocks. Metamorphic rocks have gone through all kinds of other processes too, so it only works with igneous rocks. So it's the same principle of carbon dating, it's just on larger time scales. Mm -hmm. So when a rock first solidifies from magma, it cools, solidifies, contains a set amount of potassium-40. It's locked into place. This is true of rocks that formed today. It's true of rocks formed billions of years ago. So the half-life of potassium-40 is 1.25 billion years. That's how long it takes for half of the potassium-40 in a rock to decay. And it decays into argon-40. And this process, the decay of potassium-40 to argon-40, is the only way we know of that argon-40 can form. It's the only, it's the only way we can get argon-40 is from the decay of potassium-40. So if a rock has a one-to-one -one ratio of argon-40 to potassium-40, meaning there's an equal amount of potassium-40 and argon-40 in the rock, how many half-lives has the rock gone through? One. That means the rock solidified from a molten state 1.25 billion years ago because it's gone through one half-life. If it has a ratio of 2 to 1, it means it's got twice the amount of argon is potassium. How many half-lives has it gone through? Two. 2.50 billion years old. Those are easy examples. Math's a little bit more complicated than that when you're actually measuring it because, you know, nature generally isn't that clean for us. <laughs> so, okay. here are some other examples of um, different uh, radioactive elements that we can use to use this to, uh, for this dating process. Um, Marine, we've probably all heard of potassium-4, we just went over, but there's different compounds we can use. We're not just, you know, trapped in carbon and potassium. There's other elements we can use to date, but the process is the same. This is the device that is used to um, do these experiments and observations. I don't know completely how this thing works. I used to work on a piece of equipment similar to this. Okay, but it's called an isotope ratio mass spectrometer. You basically take your rock sample, you um, uh, extract materials for it, you have a little injector site right up here, you inject your sample into the machine, it separates them out, and at the other end is a bunch of uh, detector equipment 
that can, through a, that through a process, give you an amount of potassium-40, an amount of argon-40, and all the other stuff that was in the sample, too. Gives you a nice little graph with a bunch of peaks, and then you can interpret that to get your amounts. So, the continents. We all probably know about Pangaea, the continents moving apart and coming together and doing a little dance all over the surface of the Earth. Well, the reason they're able to do that is because the continents actually float, for lack of a better word, on top of the crust. The continents are made out of granite, mostly, which is less dense than sea rock, seafloor rock, which is basalt. Most sea, sea rock, seafloor rock is mostly made out of basalt. Granite's less dense. So for the same reason that a block of wood will float in water, granite will float on top of basalt. So the continents have pretty much been the same rock they are now since they formed billions of years ago. They don't subduct back down into the magma of the earth. The seafloor does. Okay. The rocks which formed in the continents have existed in their current state when they were originally formed billions of years ago. They have moved, they've changed shape, but the actual rock material hasn't melted and reformed. And radiometric dating of these continental rocks that are deep in the interior of the, rock, of the continent show them to be about four billion years old. So here's some examples of what are called cratons. These darkened sections represent some of the oldest rocks on the planet. You know, this is South America, uh, West Africa. So the clock starts ticking. The radiometric dating tells us when a rock solidified from magma. In a liquid or gaseous state, the parent and daughter atoms are constantly being removed and replenished, so that's why it only works once the rock solidifies. So once it stops taking in that new radioactive material, that's when the clock starts ticking. And I'm going to run out of time or so I'm going to kind of zip through this. Come on. skip ahead to my anime okay so before I show you my little animation I have a, a fun video here that kind of gives you an idea of the time scales we're dealing with before we get into our talks on evolution one of the big arguments you know is the earth old enough and like I said at the beginning these are time scales that we cannot possibly conceive so I'm going to show you a little animation that represents the history of the Earth from the formation to the beginning, as if we were drawing it as moving from Los Angeles to New York. This is a, one of the mass extinctions happened 250 million years ago. 99% of all life on Earth died for about 130 miles to New York or present day. 240 million years ago, the dinosaurs start to evolve. This is when Pangaea breaks apart. Still 108 miles from New York on our timeline. 36 miles away from present day, T-Rex and Triceratops. This is the asteroid impact wiped out the dinosaurs. I mean, look how, you know, on our timeline, look how close we are to present day relative to the rest of the history of the Earth. This is where human hominids diverged from chimps. I hate it. It wasn't actually chimps. It was a common ancestor, but we'll forgive them that. <laughs> Early humans craft cutting tools from stones were one mile away. Okay, now we're 570 feet away from the center of Manhattan, where modern humans evolved 200,000 years ago. 10,000 years ago, we're 28 and a half feet from our destination, agricultural revolution. This is right, okay, so this is the beginning of recorded human history. 15.7 feet from our destination. So all this stuff leading all the way back to LA, that's before human history even started everything. We're 15.7 feet away from modern times, current uh, year. 
2,000 years ago, Jesus crucified. According to the book. <laughs> 523 years ago, we were the sales to North America. 8.2 inches away. 2.6 inches away, 75 years ago, we were to. Five years ago, we're 0.8 inches away from the current day. All that going all the way back. So these are scales that we can only try to comprehend, but they're foundational to evolution being an accurate theory. So it is important we have multiple methods to verify uh, the age of the Earth, which we do, which is great. So thank you. I'll go ahead and take take a few minutes for questions. Yes. Um, the reason we have multiple ways of verifying is because it's possible that in different types of rocks, there may not be exactly enough of each element to um, measure. Potassium-40 is ubiquitous in just about all rocks on Earth, so that's why it's the most useful and the most common. But yes, if you are able to find another element in the rock, you can use that element as well to verify your potassium-40 findings. Well, they all, they all have different half-lives, so you have to, you know, potassium has 1.25 billion years as a half-life, and all the other ones have their various half-lives, so you'd have to do different math to work backwards, but yes. Any other questions, Peter? Uh, just on the, uh, on the carbon-40 dating, uh, it depends on the amount of carbon-40 in the atmosphere, mm -hmm. and that presumably changed, and now, uh, So that's, that, that has to be accounted for in the, in the uh, calculations. Yes, and they, um, you ever doing like ice core samples from the ice? You know, the, the amount of carbon-14 could have slight fluctuations in the atmosphere as the eons go by, but you're also looking at the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12. Now, again, we're operating on the principle of uniformitarianism. We have to have multiple methods to verify those changes in carbon-14. And they can do that with ice core samples and by you know, measuring the ratios of the carbon in those ice core samples. So, but you know, the amount of carbon's changing, but the ratios have remained relatively constant over the eons according to what we're able to, um, to observe. Oh, sorry, Greenland. Yeah, um, another place is uh, there's a craton in Africa, but right now the oldest. Yeah, sorry, I like that slide too. But right, right now the oldest rocks um, were found in Greenland, and they're about four billion years old. Before that, the Earth was completely molten; it hadn't solidified yet. So, like I said, it only works for rocks once they solidify. And once they reliquify, you obviously can't use them anymore. And another thing that was on that slide is the, the rocks on the moon, they talk, brought back moon rocks because there's no geologic activity on the moon. Those are shown to be about four and a half billion years old. And if you get meteorites from space that were never part of the Earth but remain from the original material of the solar system, they're even older than that. I have not heard that. That would be interesting to research. I, I can't comment on that. Is there a specific oldest piece of material in the solar system we know of? I don't want to, I don't know off the top of my head like where, when. I'm sure it was a meteorite of some kind um, that we've, that's fallen to Earth. Couldn't tell you where or when that was, so I don't know specifically. How old it was though? Um, 
I'm pretty sure the oldest that I personally have heard of is five billion years. Um, but that's to me, I'm not positive on that, don't quote me. How about the age of the sun? Age of the sun? <laughs> um, five billion years, I think, is the most recent estimate, the age of the sun. Because once, you know, we're getting into, into astronomy here, but I can tell you, once the sun gathered enough gravity and enough pressure to ignite fusion, basically what happened is when the heat, the sun kind of lights, it blew out all of the loose material in the solar system out to the edges. You know, just like turning on a blast furnace. So, right now the sun is estimated to be about 5 billion years old. The planets themselves formed shortly after the formation of the sun. Because the sun really kind of got everything moving. Any other questions? Right. Are you talking about the, when the dark have been wiped out? I mean, so it didn't start all over again. No, um, the, the dinosaur extinction was actually a relatively mild mass extinction compared to some of the other ones we've had. There's, it's um, estimated we've had six mass extinctions on the surface of the Earth over the course of its history, um, caused by various means, uh, some of them still unknown what caused them. But you, when you go down into the geological record, you see these mass dyings of life on Earth. And the most severe one, 99% of all life on Earth was wiped out. That was, um, I think, 300 million, 250, 300 million years ago, something like that. And there was very little, but except very tiny, single cell or just you know a few cell creatures left over. And life almost did have to start over at that point. But the one that happened 65 million years ago with the dinosaurs, it wiped out about 70% of life on Earth. So pretty much all the big creatures, dinosaurs. Um, and things like that. Smaller creatures like uh, small mammals, small dinosaurs, um, scavenging creatures, things like that that didn't need a lot of food to survive, they were able to survive and they occupied the niche that dinosaurs left wide open. You know, if you're a little mammal living in the age of the dinosaurs and you crawl out of your hole, what's more than likely to happen to you? You can get eaten. <laughs> so this allowed smaller mammal-like creatures, which are our ancient ancestors, to come up out of their holes, occupy a niche that was abandoned by the dead dinosaurs, and thrive. So, if it weren't for the extinction of the dinosaurs, we wouldn't even be here. <laughs>